They came in a steady stream, seeking a new land and a better life. For over 2,000 miles of endless hardships, they followed the hope in their hearts to the virgin lands of California and Oregon. That was well over a hundred years ago. This is a contemporary wagon train, organized in the memory of those courageous men, women, and children. Each year, the Fort Seward Historical Society, based in Jamestown, North Dakota, takes a step backward in time to reenact an authentic wagon train. While they try to be true to the past, some modern-day influences cannot be completely avoided. The most important element of the pioneer wagon trains remains the same, the adventurous pioneer spirit. With each new sunrise, another long, seemingly endless day would begin. A typical day for the Fort Seward wagon train was much like a day in pioneer times. Everyone had their assigned chores to do. Wagon trains depended heavily on everyone working together. While the pioneer women took care of their families, the men looked after the teams. Care of the animals was of prime importance. The sick or lame team could spell disaster for a family. The brute strength of the animals alone pulled the wagons through the wilderness. Wagon trains were well organized. Often, the lives of hundreds of people would depend upon the guidance and wisdom of this one man, the wagon master. Well, there were professional men, I believe, from what I've read, and uh, they were under contract to certain, take a certain number of wagons to a certain place in the West. Pioneer wagon trains left from Independence, Missouri in May, just after the spring thaw. But they had only six months to get to Oregon before the harsh winter snows. Excitement ran high. The prospect of a fresh start offered great hope. It was also a sad time, a time when loved ones, families, and friends were left behind, perhaps never to be seen again. For once on the trail, there was no turning back. Pioneer wagon train was usually comprised of 40 to 50 families traveling together. Each family had their own wagon, which was their home for the crossing. And since the wagons were filled with their only possessions, everyone had to walk. Take your family and all your possessions and uh, start out maybe two or three thousand miles. I think that would be a lot of hard work and also take a lot of endurance from any man. And endure they did. But what was it really like to travel by wagon train day after day? Oh, it slows down the pace of the world quite a bit. Oh, days are long. Sometimes they're hot. Sometimes they're cold. You're in a wagon, bumpy. You're walking. It's dusty. It's very tiring. Very tired. How did they feel at the end of the day? I feel real good. I feel like we've accomplished a lot. It's really a little bit, but it seems like a lot. To the north, as the pioneers continued on their journey, they would find the Platte River in the middle of Nebraska and head due west. A flat, winding river, the settlers followed it over 500 miles to the red bluffs of the high desert. From this point on, the trail followed Indian footpaths and time-worn buffalo trails. Twenty miles a day was the goal, and good roads were prayed for by everyone. But with each new season, the condition of the trail was constantly changing. Often the pioneers were forced to build their own roads, sometimes traveling no further than a mile a day. 
the Fort Seward wagon train was privileged to have as one of its members a veteran pioneer. Yes, I came from Paducah, Texas, to Mountain Air, New Mexico, when I was three years old on a wagon, a covered wagon. My father had uh, went out there and uh, filed on a claim, and then he came back and got his family. There was only three wagons of them, and there was no danger of the Indians at that time. We came across them. From the flat, barren prairie, the western edge of Nebraska suddenly erupted into the first craggy outpost of the Rocky Mountains. Landmarks like Scott's Bluff were used by the settlers as road signs, telling them how far they had traveled and that they were still on course. The settlers now began the slow, steady climb up the Continental Divide. It soon became obvious to the inexperienced pioneers that the hills were too steep, their wagons too full. The animals strained painfully under the heavy loads. The pioneers were forced to go through their wagons, leaving their belongings in the dust to lighten the load. All that counted now was getting across. Who were these people who endured the trials of the wilderness to seek a new life? I think they were very strong, rugged, and determined people. They were hard-working people, to say that. Pretty tough people, people who must have had a, a lot of faith to, to head out someplace where they didn't really know where they were going to go. Well, they had to be hard to make it over the prairie. Well, I think they were adventurous and uh, willing to go out and, and see more different places, settle the country. Throughout the journey, rushing rivers and icy cold streams were a daily hazard. Sometimes a wagon would have to ford the same river 15 times a day. And everyone knew you crossed the river as soon as you reached it, lest it rise and obstruct your passage for days. Many times, the wagons would have to be floated across, and if they broke loose, all was lost. The ill-fated family would struggle just to save their lives. But there was something that drove these people forward, something that made them press on. I think partly they were, uh, there was a desperation and maybe an urge, an adventurous urge to see what was beyond. To find something. But some of them maybe didn't know what they were looking for. The primary motivation was economic. But there had to be, had to be a uh, sense adventure in the sense that they're willing to take the risk because you just can't uproot everything you own and your family and dump it in one wagon and go down the trail not knowing if you're going to make it to the other end because of disease or Indians or bandits. The first pioneers to push west were met by friendly Indian tribes who traded with the white man. But as the Indians lost their hunting grounds and their buffalo began to disappear in great numbers, they became increasingly hostile defending the life that they had always known. To protect the pioneers, forts were established along the trail. From out of these forts rode the cavalry troops to aid and escort the wagon trains through hostile territories. Detail halt. Lieutenant Elijah, 7th Cal, reporting to escort you through hostile territory at your request, sir. Good. One of the cavalry members explains how the cavalry played a key role in the settling of the West. Well, when the cavalry first came into the area, there was no one in the area at the time. They were opening up new territory. They were trying to secure the area so that settlers could come in and start their homes and their farms and build a country out of it. What was it like to be a cavalry officer at that time? Well, it was a tough life, a real tough life. The food was bad, the uh, weather was really hard on a person. It was just a general tough life uh, physically. But for the most part, the pioneers had to face the dangers of the wilderness alone. Loaded rifles were carried in the wagons and scouts were on the constant lookout for trouble. In case of attack, 
the Teamsters were prepared to circle up at a moment's notice. The land was huge, empty, and full of unknowns. Occasionally, they could find strength in the fact that others had made the crossing before them. On the high plains of Wyoming, the wagons rolled past Independence Rock. Here, hundreds of pioneers had stopped to chisel their names into the register of the desert. With the winter months quickly approaching, time was precious as the wagons now raced the weather. The pioneers feared the storms of rain and the winds of tornadoes almost more than the threat of Indians. Here at Devil's Gate, a 400-foot chasm high in the Rockies, a party of Mormons were caught for the winter snows and before spring more than a hundred perished. The pioneers quickly learned not to trust the clear sky, for the western weather could be treacherous. Sudden storms might engulf a wagon train, stranding them for days without food or water. It always seemed no matter how hard they pushed, nor how many miles they had come, something was constantly forcing the wagons to stop. Pioneers carried enough tools to repair their own breakdowns. Sometimes entire wagons had to be abandoned, and two families share a wagon, moving on. The high plains now gave way to the snow-capped Rockies as the settlers finally entered the South Pass. Nearly 8,000 feet above sea level, they had crossed the Continental Divide. The waters now ran to the Pacific, but there was little cause for celebration where they were merely to the halfway point. About four o'clock, while the sun was still high, the wagons would circle up. This was for protection, to keep the people and animals inside, the Indians and wolves out. Although there was enough daylight left to travel, to do so might mean injuring the teams. As the wagons stopped, the chores would begin again. Even though the pioneers were exhausted from traveling, this was no time to rest. No teamster would think how tired he might be until his team was unharnessed and cared for. The most important chore was finding safe water. As a wave of settlers tripled over the years, cholera poisoning from polluted water was a constant danger. Good water was hard to come by. Yeah. Okay. About four feet from here, you dig it about three by three. Turn your side over and build around three the edge. Three square? Yeah, about three square. Keep it around the edge so they can... Work never stopped. The pioneers never rested. Day after day, they followed the same routines. When it came to making the evening meal, each family prepared their own supper. Pioneers only ate twice a day. They had a little, little stove in the middle of the wagon, and they, they used it for heat, and they used it for cooking, and I think they probably kept it burning most of the time, and they, they lived right in that wagon. That was their house. The pioneers took food that would keep without refrigeration, dried meat, dried beans, a dried bread called hardtack, cornmeal, and coffee. Okay, what we did today was we dug down three to four feet to build a good, good fire. And you put a roasted pan of beans in there, it's like in the old days, and you put coals all around it and on top of it, and you bury it. Oh, cook. <laughs> I needn't have had worry. <laughs> I smell down. All right. You cook a lot of different foods like this, it doesn't have to just be beans. <coughs> Although the Fort Seward people were fed out of a central chuck wagon, they shared the only table their forefathers knew, the lap and the lamb. With their chores finally out of the way, the pioneers could now find a few moments of peace. But there were those among them who had one more need to answer. 
I just thought of a few things we might say tonight. The people coming across the wagon train, the real settlers, their journey was one of faith. They didn't know where they were going to end up. And I think that we all know from history that those people were religious. They were dedicated and they had to trust the Lord. Amazing grace, we With daylight, it started all over again, step by step, mile by mile, day by day. With all those hard times, I don't see how those pioneers made it. They have to depend upon their luck as far as that would hold out. That's about all they could do. If indeed the pioneers were traveling on luck, now they had to muster all they had to spare. But coming out of the Rockies, the pioneers faced their last and greatest test. 300 miles of blistering desert. The land was inhospitable, wholly unfit for human life. Wagon wheels cracked and shrunk in the intense heat. The animals became sick and refused to eat, making them weaker day by day. Everyone tried to share what few supplies were left in the vain hope all would make it across alive, yet many died for lack of food and water. But those who survived the rigors of the desert still had to push on. After living like the pioneers, would the Fort Seward people have crossed by wagon train? If I didn't have much to leave behind, if I didn't have anything there for me, I guess I would have. No, unless I was, not unless I was really desperate, I think, maybe then, you know, starving. I think I might have been able to do it. I doubt it very much. It's a hard question to answer, I don't know. After 2,000 miles of endless hardships and unmerciful weather, wagons that had rolled across hard mountain gravel and scorching desert wastelands now finally struggled into the rich green coastal valleys. Before them lay the incredible blue Pacific. Finally, they had reached the promised land. But for the pioneers, the end of the trail marked another hard beginning. They still had to struggle through the first year until there was food on the table. For the Fort Seward pioneers, the end of their journey marked a return to the present. They didn't have to clear the land, plant a crop, and build a home. They came back to civilization, back to their lives as doctors, computer programmers, farmers, and factory workers, back to the 20th century. But out on the Oregon Trail, over a hundred winters have come and gone, and still the mark of the pioneer wagons is etched into the land. It will remain through the ages as a permanent monument for those brave souls who sought the promise of the West. Come on, Jeff, Joe, Jack, Jenny. Go. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer 